this video I'm back working on the IBM 5120. If you've seen the previous videos in this series then you'll know that I'm restoring uh, this vintage computer. It was in a terrible state when I first got it, uh, badly corroded, extremely dirty and uh, I've been going through it uh, piece by piece, uh, restoring or partly restoring uh, most of the parts. This is not an actual restoration, it's just a repair but it was in such a poor condition that I had to do quite a lot of what you might consider restoration work just to try and get some chance of this ever working again. Uh, at the moment um, I've got the chassis assembly started, I've got the electronics box refitted, the power supply installed, the keyboard installed and I've been testing the uh, various supplies for quite a while now. I don't really have a schematic for any of the electronic cards in this machine. I do have interconnect diagrams, so at least I know how the various parts should be interconnected. And because of the rarity of the boards and the components in this machine, and I'm having to be very careful with the power supply to make sure it operates correctly, but that's not very easy because the power supply specification is a little bit on the flaky side. So in the maintenance manual there is this page and if you look at the table at the bottom uh, you'll see that the range of voltages is very wide and so the regulation is not all that good and uh, it does make it difficult to determine exactly how well this supply is working so the only real option I had was to hook up all the supplies uh, because they do interact to a certain degree in terms of load and um, run it up to a sensible load and what I've been doing is seeing how much um, power each rail needs to supply to bring it within uh, specification and then trying to determine if that was a sensible amount of power uh, for that rail to provide and luckily the amounts required are not that high so it does look fairly reasonable. Uh, we've got quite a number of rails so looking at the table um, the 5 volt rail, you can see I've got my Kunkin loads uh, working over time. So these are all in constant resistance mode, so I can adjust the amount of current being drawn by each rail. And the 5 volt rail is currently drawing 1.3 amps, which is quite a reasonable amount for this machine. But if I change this, it stays within the specification for quite a wide range, so it's not too bad. So the range is supposed to be 4.6 to 5.5 volts when it's loaded. So if I start increasing the resistance, then if I go up to the limit, which is there, then you can see it's about 0.7 amps, which is quite reasonable. If we go the other way and start dropping the resistance, increasing the current, then to get down to 4.6, we have to go all the way up to about three and a half amps which again seems quite reasonable if I keep going down too far the uh, supply shuts down which is what it's supposed to do so that again looks quite uh, reasonable it's the sort of thing I would expect it to do I've been doing the same thing with all the rails so I've got the uh, plus 12 volt rail plus 5 volt rail uh, I've got the 8.5 volt rail which is more of a reference voltage than anything else it doesn't uh, supply power as such and the same with the minus 12 volt rail. Again, the, the 12, minus 12 volt rail looks quite low at uh, 11 volts, but I've got it set to the limit again, and the limit is actually minus 11 volts, so uh, it's uh, within spec. And I've done the same thing with the minus 5 volt rail as well. This has now been running for about 12 hours, and uh, nothing's getting hot, nothing's shut down, um, the voltages are still pretty much exactly what they were when I um, first powered it up. I have tried running this through the ultra transformer and varying the input voltage. This does vary, uh, the regulation doesn't seem to be particularly good, but it does not vary in direct relation to the incoming um, mains voltage, so I'm assuming there is some feedback at least in the system. So this is really as far as I can go with the supply. It seems to be behaving in a reasonable way. I'm not 100% happy with it. I would much prefer to see tighter regulation, but it does appear to be within spec, so um, I have to assume it's actually working. It's just by modern standards, it's not that uh, good a supply, but uh, it is an old machine. Uh, also, the nature of the electronics in this particular machine 
um, are they're far less sensitive to variations in supply voltage than uh, modern TTL uh, machines. So uh, chances are this is fine and there aren't any real issues with it. One thing I will just briefly mention here because there was a comment or a couple of comments on this. The supply is in two parts. We've got a switching supply which is what's providing all this and there's a second part to the supply and that's the bit you can hear buzzing in the background. And that supply is for the floppy drives but it's a completely separate supply and it's not a switch mode supply. It's something I wasn't really going to mention in this series but as there was a comment I thought I would just um, touch on it briefly here. That part of the supply is actually a ferroresonant transformer. Now a little while ago I posted some videos on uh, how to make a linear version of the RD6006 uh, switching supply and in that I went through rewinding a transformer and I pointed out that you shouldn't run transformer cores into saturation because it's a bad thing. Now a ferroresonant transformer actually makes use of that and it kind of runs the transformer core into saturation and it does that so that the effective relationship between the primary and secondary winding ratios is variable and um, might sound like a weird thing to one but the reason it does that is to provide uh, a much higher degree of uh, self regulation and of a quite a wide range of input voltages and loads the output voltage is very stable much more so than on a standard type of transformer you will have noticed again in the RD6006 series that when I loaded up the transformer there was a huge change in output voltage as the load increased and with a ferroresonant transformer that effect is very much less, it's probably an order of magnitude less in terms of the voltage droop that you see on the secondary. It is a much more complex transformer to produce, they do tend to be bigger for the power that they handle um, but the benefit is um, a very good level of uh, self-regulation and IBM especially used that quite a lot in this era when this machine was being built. You don't see them that often these days in this sort of equipment, uh, if ever, um, but you do come across them quite a lot in the old IBM machines. Let me know if you're interested in that type of technology and I'll post a video specifically about ferroresonant transformers. It is quite a fascinating technology but uh, if you're not into transformers you might find it uh, a bit dull. But uh, back to this machine, what I'm going to do now is uh, refit the uh, platform that goes on top of here. So it's basically a huge sheet of very thick metal, so this thing. I'll bolt that in place. Once that's uh, in place or part of that process, I want to make sure that I can easily slide the electronics box in and out so that uh, I can uh, gain access to it for fitting the cards and doing testing once everything's in place. I will of course run the uh, power cable through to the uh, electronics box to get that plugged in. I'll get the keyboard cable plugged in and once that's in place and I can move the box in and out and we've got the platform on, I can fit the monitor and then uh, I can start refitting the cards to the electronics box. I had intended to fit them all one by one but because of the way the power supply works I may end up having to fit them all at once just to make sure that the power supply uh, falls within its proper operating range when they're plugged in. I will also start fitting some of the hardware. As you can see I've been um, refinishing this, stripping it, repainting it, uh, cleaning up the various connectors. They were badly corroded and as you see they've uh, cleaned up extremely well. Uh, so I completely stripped these down and these are also now ready for refitting. So I want you on camera, be fairly dull and watch me bolt these into uh, position. Uh, but once it's in place I'll get back on camera, we'll have a quick look at it uh, and then um, in the next video we'll look at actually refitting some of the electronics cards. I have the clamp back in place that holds the ribbon cable from the power supply. I've got the keyboard floppy cable fed back through, it's not plugged into the motherboard yet but it is in place and in theory I should now just be able to slide uh, this box in and out as I need to to access the cards. Uh, the idea here is this loop from the power supply should enable me to slide it all the way in and out 
and that gives me access to the cards even when the platform is fitted on top and of course um, I'll need to be able to do that as I uh, work on the various parts. You can see that as I say the, um, the keyboard cable is not uh, yet plugged in, that plugs into this socket on the motherboard and uh, the other various interconnects go onto the um, connectors along the front and back of the motherboard and then there are a couple of clamp bars that uh, screw onto these holes front and back uh, that hold these in place and stop them popping out. Okay, so what I'll do now is get the um, platform put back on and once I've done that I can refit the monitor, refit the control panel and then in the next video as I said I can start refitting the cards. So that's the platform refitted and bolted in place. I've been making sure as I've installed all these bits and pieces that the loops of wire um, for the ribbon cables, keyboard, power um, are all free to move so that the electronics box will slide freely in and out without the wire uh, binding up and catching on anything because of course I do need to slide this in and out as part of the repair process and also it's supposed to slide in and out freely as uh, part of the general maintenance process. So I've been making sure they're in the right place. The cable ties are just temporary. I'll replace those with uh, tape as was on the original once I've got everything sorted out. And uh, what I can do now is turn my attention to the monitor. So I've got the monitor. As you can see, it needs cleaning, testing. I'll do the same thing with this that I did with the Intel uh, MDS. I'll make a simple test jig just so I can run the monitor up make sure that I can display something on the screen. These tend to be fairly simple if they're running and what I don't want to do is spend a lot of time uh, searching for faults in the electronics trying to drive the monitor just to find out it's a simple monitor fault. So in the next video we'll look at getting the monitor sorted out, uh, get it cleaned up and uh, see if we can get something to display on the screen and then we can reinstall it into the chassis and start to reinstall the electronics and see if we can bring this machine back to life.